Hi guys, welcome to Questioning Behaviour. Uh, I am one of two of your co-hosts, Sarah Bowen, and I'm here with my friend, Mela Van Acker. Yeah, here I am. Good morning, everyone. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. Today we're actually going to talk with uh, a friend of mine who I'm really, really... Uh, happy to say is kind of changing the game specifically with how we consume behavioral science which i think is just amazing so before we dive into all of that sarah how did you actually fall into behavioral science like was it by books or through um podcasts i mean i suppose podcasts weren't that popular about five years ago when we fell into behavioral science but how do you consume mm. it yeah i mean it was always books really wasn't it if you you know, sort of had a, a, an interest. You know, there wasn't really any of these uh, documentaries out there yet. I think I'm thinking of the Dan Ariely one, um, which which is quite a good watch. But yeah, definitely books. I remember like at the poolside on holiday reading Freakonomics, uh, and someone, I think a, a, a woman actually came up to me and said, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe you're reading that book." Um, like a, this, this child is reading Freakonomics and she was very impressed. <laughs> and maybe that's just the, the type of praise I've been chasing my whole life of people <laughs> coming up to me being like, that's an interesting book or that's an interesting thing you're doing. Um, I, yeah. I love how you signal your value through the books that you choose to read at the poolside. Well, um, <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. It opened my eyes that the type of value signaling was possible. <laughs> I see. No, I'm I'm actually very much the same. I, I rolled into it through books as well, though I have to admit, I feel like I found the topic before I found the books. I think I read most academic papers before I actually read any of the pop science what? books. Yeah, weird, isn't it? Yeah, because you're so weird. Been, yeah, I know I'm weird, but like I have always been a keen psychologist and my dad's an economist, so it was actually inevitable at the best of times. Mm. Um but yeah, so I think I think most people have rolled in this field, you know, especially if they're a bit older through books. And then I think, you know, a couple of websites and blogs started popping up, you know, making it a bit more mainstream, a bit more accessible. And then, of course, there's been a plethora of podcasts oh, yeah. uh, as this, yeah, as this medium is stepping up to the plate. But I feel like you know, although Sarah at the ripe age of 15 might have been reading Freakonomics by the poolside, I think most people currently, they, they really seek out their content online. And I think most of the information that people want to find now kind of comes in snappy YouTube films and maybe of YouTube videos and, um, I don't know, like tutorials and stuff. So, and I always thought that this was kind of a massive niche in the market. Like it's, it's, it's a gap because there, there isn't anything out on YouTube, which I think is super behavioral science-y. Well, like, that, I might that highly that. edited behavioral science-y stuff. Like you've got the TED Talks, you've got like long form interviews, uh, visual podcasts, like these, these sort of conversations about behavioral science are happening on YouTube. But I know exactly what you mean. That sort of tightly edited 10 minute, a review of a certain topic, you know, position for a, for a general audience that's really accessible. Um, yeah. Or just an explanation of a bias or just, you know, trying to figure out what does behavioral economics, what does behavioral economics have to say about this or behavioral science to some extent, you know, use them interchangeably if you want to. Um, so yeah, this type of stuff. So I, I, I remember seeing this gap in the market about like two years ago, but this is the thing, like I love talking, but I've got none of the other skills to actually become a YouTuber, like <laughs> zero. Um, so I have always been real, really happy, as I already said at the start, that, you know, a friend of mine actually decided to get into it. And I think so far he's doing really, really well. So I think that leads very nicely to introducing our next guest. So today we're actually talking to Peter Judo Di Harcio and don't don't butcher me for the pronunciation. I've tried, man. I've tried, honestly. But we're talking to my friend Peter. Peter, tell the audience who are you? Uh, hello, I'm Peter Judo Di Harcio. Your pronunciation wasn't that bad. Don't worry. Thanks. And um, I'm a cocky 22 year old with a YouTube channel <laughs> who somehow managed to make it on this podcast. Um, <laughs> Great intro. Hey, no, I'm you so fit right in. Yeah. You fit right in. We're, we're cocky 26 year olds with a podcast. Hey, I'm so. 25. Cut me some slack. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> so we're, we're all we're all young and so in love with the sound of our own voice that we thought we should take this mainstream and go multimedia. That's exactly <laughs> what we did. That's pretty much it. That's essentially no. it. <laughs> okay, but for real, I'm I'm a, I'm a master student at the University of Warwick. I'm studying behavioral and economic science, and I did my undergraduate at Warwick as well. I did a pretty unique degree, uh, which not many people know because it's unique to Warwick. It's called Psychology and Global Sustainable Development, which means that. <laughs> Half of my degree was uh, psychology modules, so I was trained as a psychologist. But then the other half of my degree was very cross-disciplinary. So uh, global nice. sustainable development encompassed uh, a lot of economics, um, ecology, politics, um, policy making, geography, sociology. So it was very, very uh, broad and liberal second half of my degree, which I think fed really nicely into behavioral economics, but it was all kind of focused with a sustainability focus. I'm actually tell you a little bit about my values as well as a, as a person. And you support capitalism. I like it. Yeah, I love it. Absolutely. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, you know, capitalism and sustainability, they go hand in hand. Yeah, they go really. great together. Um, and I have a YouTube channel and that's probably what you want to talk to me about today. The most. <laughs> I, oh, that's I, nice I, and blunt. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, I, I, so I started this about, I would say about seven months ago, maybe less than that. And it's really taken off. It was kind of a, a, a COVID project because I was, I was bored in my house. Yeah, and I we thought, understand, hey, mate. We understand. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I was like, hey, you know, what can I do with my time that's productive? And I thought, hey, well, I've been wanting to actually make a YouTube channel about behavioral science for a while now. I don't think there's a, there's much of it out no. there, like like edited uh, YouTube content on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, well, I have those skills. Why don't I do that since I love talking about behavioral science anyway? And it kind of, it was nice that it coincided with COVID actually, because it meant that um, all these older academics were suddenly very literate at how to use like online video calls, which I could record. <laughs> um, so after I got a few yeah. videos out, it meant that, you know, I could call really cool people like um, Wendy Wood and Rory and uh, Elizabeth Loftus and all these really uh, nice. impressive people within our field. And they were all like very comfortable doing Zoom interviews with me, which was uh, a really fun experience. And it's still a really fun experience. Cool stuff. Oh, cool. Um, I mean, before, before we get started, we're talking about the YouTube channel. What's it like being a student right now? How are you doing? Are you okay? It's, <laughs> it's tough. It is a bit weird, like not going into university um, and just doing almost a hundred percent of my of my learning online. Um, but at the moment, I'm I'm just coding every day. I'm just doing R and MATLAB and and coding. So being in, stuck in the house all day is kind of what I'd be doing anyway, even if the shops were open. So yeah. <laughs> it's not really that different. <laughs> Good. I'm good. Good to hear things are, are going okay. Because I don't, I don't think we get to hear from, you know, Sarah, people who are actually did you, did you right just say, I'm glad you're okay. The dude is doing MATLAB and R. He's crying on the inside. <laughs> He's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> Outwardly okay, I guess. Yeah. No, really cool. I mean, how, what's it been like to try and get it off the ground? Well, what were you just, I mean, I guess for the initial part of building a YouTube channel, you have to be quite internally driven, just, you know, a bit of fun, like a hobby, but it's, you've gained, I guess, quite a bit of a, a following, some momentum quite quickly. What's that, what's that been like to see it grow? Yeah. So I actually have a, another YouTube channel, which I, I won't plug it here, but oh, um, that's how, that's how, plug, plug. that's, <laughs> that's how I, that's how I got started. And in that one, I, I would talk about like going to the gym and stuff like that. And, but what I found with that channel is that I, I constantly want to talk about the behavioral science of fitness. And I was like, well, and then I, then I, then I divulged from that saying, well, I actually want to talk about just behavioral science generally, and not just about how that relates to, to fitness. Uh, so that's, that was my impetus. So I already had the, the, the editing skills and the, the, the setup and some, some equipment and stuff. So that's how I got uh, going with that. And yeah, the, the growth response has been a surprise to, to me as well. Like I, I was expecting like 11 subscribers or something. Like I didn't think anyone would care. Um, I was one of the first 11, I would like to add. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marilyn. Um, yeah, for your listeners at home, Marilyn and I have been friends for a couple of years now. So yeah, for sure. um, we know each other pretty well. But um so yeah, so it's, it's been really, really surprising um, how much people have enjoyed the content. Uh, I mean, I mostly promote it just through through Facebook and, and LinkedIn and stuff. Um, mm. But people seem to share the content a lot. I was very lucky 
to be featured in um, Samuel Seltzer's Habit Weekly newsletter, which he distributes. Mm -hmm. And I got featured in there a few times, actually. And that that really bumped up my my viewership and my numbers as well. And obviously landing uh, amazing guests. I was really lucky that... um, Rory, just before I started my YouTube channel, Rory actually reached out to me and was like, hey, let's have a call um, between the two of us. So I called Rory uh, off, not recording, not, not for wow. an interview. And 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 he was like, oh, you know, think about what you can do in the meantime. And we were talking about making video and stuff. And he said, and he said, yeah, there's not enough video and behavioral science. It was actually Rory who kind of inspired me to make the channel, uh, to really give you that final push to, to make it happen. And um, and then he, of course, came on the channel as well. And that was a, a really great interview. And so, yeah, it was a yeah. really good interview. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. So, yeah, it's, it's been a fantastic <laughs> experience so far. And, and yeah, the growth is as surprising to me as it is to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, Not I, I don't, surprising at all. No, I don't think it's no. surprising at all. I mean, you said yourself, there wasn't really something uh, in the market. Like there was a gap in the market. Because when you type in... Uh, now I'm doing this from memory and I have the memory of a goldfish. If you type in behavioral science or behavioral economics into YouTube, I think what you get is a couple of like TED talks or TED-ish like talks. Mm-hmm. Whereas Ariely, uh, I've seen talks by Kelly Peters come past or come by, sorry. Uh, just, yeah. you know, really like really famous tend to be academics type people, but you know, Kelly Peters isn't an academic. Rory is definitely in that list as well of just people, you know, who are very much on the forefront of that field, but at the same time are very public people because not every, you know, person who's highly ranked in behavioral economics is very public or very PR focused, (laughs) if you will. And I think most people or most of them might not have been able to operate Zoom before COVID. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's kind of what I noticed as well is that when I would search behavioral science on youtube or behavioral economics on youtube uh you just be hit with a lot of uh lectures and they were all like hour-long videos or 45 minute long videos and i was like well these are not these are not really that stimulating for most people you know maybe people want to see like you know highly edited content you know succinct um engaging yeah visuals. Ten, 10 minutes or nothing mate 10 minutes or nothing <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah exactly so that's what i wanted to put out and uh put out sort of more more digestible behavioral science content in video form um yeah yeah it it lends itself perfectly to the to the format so i mean i think the only other sort of uh behavioral science youtube stuff i think crash course is that like hank and john green's company they've done some economics more focused Mm -hmm. videos and have offshooted a little bit but nothing dedicated so thanks thanks for filling the gap in the market i mean it's it's my pleasure it's it's a lot of fun for me obviously i I don't earn any money from it or anything so it's all it's all just um for fun yeah you don't earn any money yet i'm pretty sure for youtube you need to have like a thousand subscribers and then you can start earning money so you're close it's not just a thousand but you need like a a certain amount of viewership per per year and it's it's not that it's it's not that easy to reach that threshold so i mean the, the goal for me is not really to make money from it it's really just to make content which i feel proud of and it's probably similar for you guys with this podcast as well but also it's just an excuse to talk to really cool people right yeah uh, <laughs> for me it's an excuse to talk to sarah she never picks up my phone like when I <laughs> this is the only way i get to yeah. see her no it's all right this is yeah this is how we socialize really now <laughs> apparently but uh we no, are it's so good. lame <laughs> 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 it is interesting with with a with a podcast or with my youtube channel there are certain questions that you just can't ask in normal conversation no. right it, it would it would be bizarre and, and add left of field but when you put it in the context of oh this is an interview which is going to be put yeah. out into the public then suddenly you could ask these like really interesting questions to people like the questions they've been burning to ask them for so long and um yeah and that's that's kind of the joy of it as well fair play so I'm going to ask you a question, which is kind of in that vein then. So far of all the videos you've done, which one is your favorite and which one are you proudest of? That's a really tough question. Um, so it's it's easy to, for me to just say, oh, my interview with Rory would be sure. my favorite because mm-hmm. uh, Rory was... You're in the... love with Rory Sutherland. <laughs> okay, let's let's not go there. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but Rory is definitely like a huge hero of mine growing up mm. and, you know, I... I remember when I was first getting into behavioral science, I'd I'd watch like I saw Dan Ariely's TED talk, and then I saw Rory's four TED talks after that, <laughs> um, and I was like, "This is so cool!" and and how that applies to business, and uh, how this applies to marketing. I was like, "Well, 
that's that's kind of how I got started um, in the field, just watching these talks and watching Rory, and then being able to talk to him and for an hour, you know, on the podcast was like uh, on the on the YouTube video was uh, incredible. Um, but in terms of content that I produced that wasn't an interview, um, I really like my video on stereotype threat, and it's actually not one of my most popular videos. No, uh, I, I you told me that it essentially yeah, bombed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's one of my last popular videos, but um, I just thought it was. A, a, an area of behavioral science which doesn't get much light shone on it it's mm -hmm. i think it's really important for uh for the modern challenges that we kind of face in today's like culture and society because you know, we were yeah. talking about trying to solve problems of inequality and and racial biases and, and racism and and stereotype threat really plays into that in a big way because Okay, so I don't know if your audience, Ria, should I explain stereotype threat? Perhaps Probably. that would be useful. Yeah, yeah. I, I can ask the question, what the hell is stereotype threat? <laughs> okay, so st stereotype threat came from uh, Claude Steele and his co-authors at Stanford, I think. And what they're looking at is how does a bias towards a certain uh, group or a certain minority, how does that affect their performance on various tasks? Um, does does just the, by the nature of being stereotyped as a minority does that affect your performance and what they find is that it does and it's been um replicated many times um by lots of different studies and so i'll tell you my favorite study which actually doesn't come from Claude Steele, but my favorite one comes from uh, a study on asian american women mm -hmm. right and this was conducted back in i think the 80s i might be wrong on that but um it was, it was a while ago and obviously back in the 80s uh, things weren't as progressive as they are now. And so Asian women had two conflicting stereotypes about them. They had the Asian stereotype, which was um, that Asians are really good at maths, right? And then they had the the female stereotype that women are worse at maths, worth, worse at maths than men. And what happens when they took the study was the, the uh, researchers would manipulate which uh, stereotype they were being primed with prior to the study. And the way they did that was they said, on on half the group, can you write your ethnicity on the front of the paper before you take this maths test? And for the other group, they said, can you write your gender before you take the maths test? And then there was a control group where they didn't write anything. And what they found was if they prime them with the ethnicity stereotype, they actually perform better than the, than the control. And if they mm -hmm. prime them with the gender stereotype, they perform worse. And this is the same group of people. And mm -hmm. so... That's a really, to me, that's a really well done study, like really robust to show just how how that works and how basically just being primed with this idea that you're supposed to perform worse actually makes you perform worse. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Has it replicated? Do you know? Yeah. I don't know if that specific study is replicated, but there's a lot of stereotype threat literature out there, like a, a, oh. a lot. Um, I think the original stereotype, I, can't, I said it in my video now, but it's been cited like a thousand times or something like that it's like a, okay. a, a lot a lot of pe people cite it and um right i had, I, had a, I had a call with uh this wasn't on my youtube channel but i had a call with someone called dave nussbaum who's mm -hmm. at chicago booth and he mm -hmm. also is an editor for um the behavioral scientist um, yeah. newsletter and he did some research on stereotype threat before and the way he explained the mechanism um, was really interesting because he said stereotype threat is actually uh, it's a cognitive load problem yeah. because what what we see is that for the majority of tests we don't observe a difference but when we do observe a difference it's because the test is pushing them right at the boundary of their cognitive ability right mm -hmm. and so you know uh, let so if we take the the Asian versus non Asian uh, example again so if you if you have uh, an Asian versus a non-Asian person taking a math test, if the math test is easy, they should perform at a similar level, right? Given that they are similar level uh, students beforehand. Sure. H however, um, if the math test is really difficult, so you're really pushing them to the boundary of their ability, and then you prime them with a stereotype, what the what happens then is that the the group which is expected to perform worse performs worse in that respect. Um, and it's because if you, because when they're taking the math test, rather than just thinking, oh, you know, do I use sine, cosine, or, or tangent here? They're thinking, <laughs> do I use sine, cosine, or tangent? And uh, if I get it wrong, am I going to be reflecting poorly on 
on this this magnifying glass which I'm being put under as as a stupid person who does bad at maths. So it's like an extra thing for them to think about. You know, it's it's an extra thing that adds cognitive load to them. And so the maths test is actually harder for them because they have to think about this extra component all the time of am I confirming or disconfirming the stereotype about my group? Interesting. Interesting. But it it seems as though if you prime people with the the stereotype that that should improve their performance, they do they do do better is that what the first study suggests yeah so it's you do they do seem to get a small bump but the the bigger difference is is on the negative so when you're the negatively yeah. stereotype group that's where we see the biggest uh drop in or biggest change in performance and so i think that's the most robust finding of of those studies is, is the negative drop okay and and the thing about stereotype threat which i love so much as well is that it doesn't just apply to academia and and, and maths tests but it, it seems to like uh be consistent across so many different domains and and because every single um ethnic group or or or, or social group is uh can be negatively stereotyped depending on the domain sure. all these groups show the negative stereotype effect um so do you guys you guys probably know the the iat right the implicit association mm-hmm. task right yes so uh for your audience who don't who might not know the implicit association task it's basically um, you have to match words to a, a group of things on the left or the right. And so uh, you might have black and white as two different like races, like black people, white people. And then that's black is on the left, white is on the right. And then you'd have like good and bad um, as underneath one. If good and black is paired together and then you're slow at associating the the good word with that group, then that seems to suggest that you have an implicit bias uh, against black people, right? So that's the mm-hmm. implicit association task. And there's obviously a stereotype that um, white people are more racist than non-white people. And so if you prime that stereotype, then white people actually become more racist on the <laughs> on the IAT. And that's that's a finding um, which I thought was really interesting. But it, this also carries through to sports performance. Um, so if um, white people were paired against black people and the stereotype primed is that black people would be better at sports than white people, mm-hmm. then um, when they then perform on a sports task, the white people would perform worse. And then, and then obviously that effect disappeared if the stereotype wasn't primed. And so it seems to be like really robust across many domains and... That's why I thought it was a really cool video. Um, yeah, definitely. A really cool topic. Yeah, we think so. Yeah, so just people are just super malleable, I guess, and mm. and words matter. These these, you know, I guess mostly negative, but also positive stereotypes can affect the way that people behave or make decisions in unconscious ways. I mean, have you ever seen like uh, follow up questionnaires? Like, what were people actually thinking about? Were they thinking about it consciously? A lot of these studies have those typical interview questions where they ask them like for post-rationalization or they ask them like do you did you do you think that this stereotype being primed would affect your performance those types of questions and you know as per usual in behavioral science studies the answer is always like oh no there's no way there's no way that that would affect my actual uh, i wonder more about i don't care that much about whether they think it affects them because we we are so poor at estimating what does and doesn't affect us i would be more interested in seeing whether they actually think that stereotype is true because a lot of this type of stuff it seems like Mm. you really have to internalize that type of stereotype to make that work especially because I remember the fact being, like you said, rather robust, but I also remember it being quite large. But if it's, for example, to me, if someone tells you to me, women are shit at mathematics, I flip them off and I ace my mathematics test. Like, I'm yeah, not that yeah. bothered because I don't believe in gender-based stereotypes and hopefully I also don't believe in race-based stereotypes. At, at least I like to think I don't. Sorry, sorry, don't want to jump in here. On that point, so Claude Steele did a, um, a follow-up study to his original study where he got... Uh, so it was again women and men doing a maths test, and then the women primed with the stereotype that women were worse did uh, did more poorly than than the uh, the control group. But then he did another group where he would tell the women, um, "You may have heard a stereotype that women are worse at maths than men, but uh, according to our history doing this test, that stereotype isn't true. And on this test, women perform just as well as men on this test. And then with that initial prime." Right, where he directly addresses the stereotype and mm-hmm. uh, says that it's false, yeah, um, the effect disappears, and so women perform just as well as men do. Um, mm. 
after that. So it does it. The way I think about it is a kind of um, manipulating people's identity, right? So we have this. Sure. Um, so in behavioral science, we we can often think of things as like, do do people weigh up pros and cons in a situation, or is it more like, um, what is my identity in this situation, and then what do people who share this identity do in this situation, right? And that's mm-hmm. kind of another way to think about sure. um, behavioral science, right? And so if you dispel this identity, right, this this uh, this identity that you're going to perform worse, then the effect seems to disappear. Cool. So this this is, I suppose, a, a one zero for positive affirmations downloaded from Tumblr and said to yourself each morning, I can do it. I am a good person. Women are <laughs> epic. Women can take over the world. I will do this every morning now. It might have an effect. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. And so exactly. And I, th- I think I think that kind of gives us hope, right, that just having positive rhetoric and saying sort of publicly addressing these um these stereotypes that exist within our culture can actually have a positive effect. And it's not just words because it does actually have an effect on how people perceive themselves and, and actually how they perform in real life as well. Um, so yeah, I like to think of behavioral <laughs> science in a very hopeful way. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good. So that actually spurs on very nicely to, to one of my next questions. So you've already mentioned that your background is in sustainability on top of, you know, psychology next, next to uh, behavioral science, if you will. Uh, that you have an interest in behavioral science when applied to fitness. Um, for the for our audience, Peter also works with Wendy Wood, who is an expert on uh, the domain of habits. So with, with all these clusters just kind of circling about, what do you want to do with behavioral science? <laughs> I mean, That's I, a big question. <laughs> I, think you, I think you've touched on my problem, right? Is that I, <laughs> I have my, my hands in so many pots that I don't know really where to throw my energy uh, wholeheartedly. I seem to, and obviously with, with, with YouTube as well, I'm always like researching a new thing, right? What's the next video going to be? Oh, hey, let's look up a new topic and really go in depth on that. And um, I think I think uh, Colin Camera on your podcast last time said something similar where he said, you know, the thing I'm most interested in is whatever I'm working on at the moment, yeah. right? And that's kind of what I find as well. So whatever I'm working on at the moment, I, I get really interested in. So recently, obviously, I've been working with Wendy for um, a few months now. Mm-hmm. And as a result of working with, you know, the world's greatest habit expert, I got really interested in, in habits, mm-hmm. right? So I, I, that's, Surprise. yeah, I'm like, I'm like obsessed with, with habits at the moment. It's, it's, and whenever I'm learning anything during my degree or during um, my lectures and stuff, I always am thinking like, oh, how, how does this relate to habits? You know, that's kind of where my mind goes all the time. Um, I've also been reading um, Robert Sapolsky's uh, Behave. I don't know if you guys, you guys know Robert Sapolsky? Yeah, he's a, he's a, anthropologist biologist behavioral yeah, biologist i'm pretty sure he's got quite a strong background in evolution i mean he must given what that yeah. book is about he, he works with chimps uh, who he did for a long time anyway and yeah. and that that opened up a whole new uh, area of behavioral science for me as well because um you know thinking about behavioral science not just in terms of you know well what biases or heuristic is this but also you know how does this relate to genetic factors how does this relate to yeah. um, how do animals behave in similar situations and how can we apply that to how humans behave and is is it appropriate to apply that to how humans behave and how do genes affect our behavior and all these other um cross-disciplinary factors that i probably hadn't have considered before as well um yeah. so uh, where do I want to throw myself in behavioral science? I want to work first in as a practitioner, you know, work for the bit or, or a, a consultancy. Or for um, Rory. Yeah, or for Rory. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to work Rory, for Rory. So, Rory, someone wants to work for you. <laughs> now, that's, that's kind of an, an interesting question. I mean, like, from your perspective, sort of thinking about what's next what direction am i going to take this interest it's like why go down the practicing route first like is there in your eyes what's the benefit of taking a break from academia sort of maybe leaving that door open but it's because i'm friends with merlo and merlo tells me how much pain she's in about her phd yeah 
yeah. Oh yeah. Talk to any PhD student and they will just it's a world yeah. of pain. And it is. The thing is I was you know, I'm doing I'm doing all this coding now and I'm and I was thinking like, oh, you know, I can actually process data now. I can actually like, you know, do studies now. Hmm, maybe I would do a PhD. And I and I talked to Merlin and she's like, No, don't do a PhD. <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> um so perhaps in the in the future, like I'm not I'm not throwing it off the cards completely, but I think definitely I wanna just work first and, and see what I can do in the field because that's I find that very satisfying as well like being able to use behavioral science in a positive way that really helps people out I think that's kind of the most motivating thing for me to get good at behavioral sciences so that I can do that well you know yeah, I love it. I, I would like to vindicate myself. Um, I would like to very quickly throw in that I only very heavily discourage Peter specifically from doing a PhD, knowing that his entire personality and work ethic and how he approaches problems falls more within the practitioner's side. I would <laughs> like to have that mentioned. Yeah, I think I think also like because because my interests change like within the field like so rapidly i i can't really at the moment at least see myself working on on one thing for like five years um most academics yeah. don't actually i think most academics i mean they although i'll admit that academia is slow but they tend to run very different projects at the same time anyway and not not that relevant currently so let's finally dive in properly into the actual social media side of this conversation because yeah, that was supposed it. to be the topic so you have uploaded a very quick, and this this is going to show my age because I don't know what's actually called, but like a really quick snippet on uh, Instagram where you actually discussed the behavioral science kind of behind the YouTube algorithm. Would you like to share a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so there's a I I noticed this trend um, recently on YouTube mm. that uh, a lot of YouTubers were doing across lots of different genres, and they would they would uh, show their analytics on their video and they would say um, 70 or 80% of you watching this video aren't subscribed to my channel. Oh, I hate it when they say that. Right. They always say right. that. And they, yeah. A lot of people are doing it these days. And so I noticed this trend. I was thinking, okay, if I was a, if I was a, a, a behavioral scientist working for this person, I would say, that's a terrible idea, right? Why, why would you show everyone in your audience that the social norm for watching your videos is to not subscribe, right? That the majority of people don't subscribe. That's like the opposite of what you should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, you should be saying, hey, I'm approaching this subscriber goal. Look how many people have already subscribed to my channel, right? That's how you work with a minority and trying to still mm -hmm. create a social norm, right? As you say, yeah. oh, look at all the people who have already subscribed to my channel that you should join them and subscribe. Don't say most people don't subscribe because <laughs> that's going <laughs> that's to yeah. provide the opposite incentive. Um, so I noticed that, but... Again, I also thought, well, let's let's look at the point of view from the YouTuber, right? If you're a, a YouTuber and you see other successful YouTubers doing this on their channels, mm -hmm. then you you have a social proof validation mm -hmm. for doing this as well. It's like, oh well, this person with you know X number of million subscribers, they do it on their channel, so it can't be bad, right? But sure, um, the thing with YouTube is that it's not a controlled environment. Right. No, so not very. <laughs> no, not at all. It's it's highly volatile. You know, I could I produce like I could produce like a really really high quality video, and it'll 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 bomb. It'll it'll get like you know not many views at all. And then I'll I'll make I made a video recently called um, Five Uber Nudges, right? And it's just mm. I did like I have ten minutes of research for this, like because it was like just stuff which I kind of knew and sure. observed and had heard from other people talk about. And I filmed it in the course of like two hours and edited it in like two hours. And then I put it out and it's like got like almost a thousand views. <laughs> and, and it was like, you know, so it's like the, the effort to view ratio is like, you know, completely out of whack. And so the thing with YouTube is that trying to be trying to be a behavioral scientist on YouTube, you can't do it like a like you would do like a randomized control trial. Like because first of all, your videos are different as well, so you can't even compare Sure, sure. That as a, as, a, as a constant as well. So um, instead, you kind of just have to look at what do I know about behavioral science, and then how can I? Mm. What do I think will work? But there's no real way of like testing it in a in a. Yeah. Way. No, I'm because I'm starting to think yeah. now, like you know, five Uber hacks, or you know, if you just look at that title, like first of all, I the list. It's the list. This is the thing. Like I click yeah, yeah. articles that tell me that like oh three ways to improve this or seven ways to do this or and i'm just like oh my god i need to know seven ways of budgeting whereas i already know everything there is to know about budgeting like i can't know anymore wow, everything 
<laughs> I, w- I would like to say so. I've read Abby Sussman's latest paper. Thank you very much. <laughs> no. Okay, so yes, you do know everything. I do know everything. <laughs> if I know what Abby knows, I'm I'm very close to everything. Um, but no, it's it's just it's this list thing. People love lists, and then I think if you throw like a big name at like Uber, which recently has been in the media quite a lot, is very very controversial. Has been controversial for years, yet also a household name. In hindsight, with my lovely hindsight bias, mm. I can see why this video would be very successful. So, but then of course the idea is, can you replicate this with like you know six ways of uh, making it big on YouTube, or you know six, uh, seven behavioral science tricks applied by Facebook, or whatever big company name you want to insert there? It's this, it's this delicate balance as a as a YouTuber, if I can call myself that. Um, yes, yeah, you but- can. If you're, if I'm going really hard and really just trying to push growth and engagement mm. as much as possible, I could produce like a lot of very high engagement videos and stuff which I knew, which I know will do pretty well. Like, oh, um, yeah, like list videos and like, mm-hmm. oh, uh, thinking fast and slow in five minutes. Oh, react oh, videos. God, or yes. react videos. Yeah. Or, you know, stuff like that. But mm-hmm. thinking fast and slow in five minutes, I would like to add absolutely no disrespect to Professor Kahneman. Um, but please do that because I can't get through the book. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I will make it then. Um, but at the same time, um, because I because this is not my job, right? It's just a, a hobby for me. Um, oh, yeah, we're giving you fuck tons of work, but you don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I need to, I need to. I want to produce content which I'm really proud of and I think that actually adds like genuinely good value to my audience and isn't just like lazy like really really lazy content and if you uh, have pushed yourself through thinking fast and slow you have done more work than anyone (laughs) can ever claim to have no have you finished the book I no I just I just I struggled very much with that book I did I I did finish it and I, I I put I was in the envir- I was in the perfect environment to finish the book because I was on, I was almost I was I was on ho- it was many years ago this is maybe six years ago I was on holiday um, with my with my family in Malaysia which is where a lot of my family are from and my my grandparents they live in this like really really rural place where there's like no Wi-Fi. no no yeah no Wi Fi like nothing to do. And I just got into behavioral science and my, my friend from school, who was really smart, he said like, oh, I, uh, this is like a really good behavioral science book and it gives me thinking fast and slow. And so that summer I just sat in this like old village where there's no Wi-Fi and just finished the whole book and there was like nothing else to do. And so I did finish it in one go. And, um, Very proud of you. Thank you. So yeah, I have finished thinking fast and slow. Anyway, but getting, getting back to YouTube. So what I've learned um, from doing YouTube for a couple of years now, including the old channel, is mm-hmm. that just pushing for views and being so focused on views and subscribers and growth is really bad for your mental health. It's oh, like, yeah. yes. it is awful. It is so awful because you're, you know, you basically tie your self-worth to how much engagement mm-hmm. a video gets. And that's that's just really unhealthy and mm-hmm. so yeah um whilst you know, obviously i'm super grateful for like all the people who like subscribe to me and watch my videos but you're so welcome but i thank you but i'm not going <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to tie that to my self-worth instead i want to put out content that i feel proud of that's good if it bombs it bombs if it does great it does great but at least i could put out a video and say well i'm actually really happy with how this turned out i'm really happy with the final product and i think that's just a much healthier like sustainable way to go about like having you know a long-term plan uh, for the channel um because otherwise I'll, I'll just be making list videos like every week and it'll just be a i'll just turn it to buzzfeed for behavioral science like and i don't want to do that. Ooh, <laughs> that is a burn that's so wise that is so wise honestly because i think there's I mean, I've I've watched a couple of other YouTubers try and explain their process of how they try and maximize engagement and all these sort of things about the different colors and images you use on thumbnails and the type of titles. And there are all these sort of things you can experiment with. But I think I think you've hit the nail on the head at the end of the day. You know, if the if the goal is is exactly as you've said, like to just put out content you're proud of, then you can find a way to do that that just you know, fulfills that goal your own way rather than having to chase or find the secret formula, which is constantly probably changing as well. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. The YouTube, the YouTube algorithm is a, is a phantom. It just shifts content constantly. And, but the, the metric which I pay the most attention to actually is not views, but viewer retention. Um, mm-hmm. Because 
that to me means that people have clicked on the video and they actually really enjoy it and so they watch it to the end right and, and so a bot. Yeah. right yeah they're not a bot exactly so i i've got a couple of videos with like you know a few thousand views right and that that's like wow that's incredible that like you got a few thousand mm -hmm. views in the video but i look at the viewer retention and it's like 30 seconds and i'm like oh so they literally just clicked it and clicked off and but then i have other videos with you know maybe a couple hundred views right not not as well performing and but the viewer retention will be like super high and that's a, and i feel way more proud of that because i'm like oh people really like that content and that type of content tends to get the most comments as well or mm -hmm. people like giving positive feedback saying oh i really enjoyed this video i subscribe because of this video it's really well researched and written and edited or whatever and so that's that's what i want to do for my channel is, is is put out content which people enjoy in the long term kind of trust me as a as a as a brand of a youtuber rather than just like putting out stuff which gets a lot of short-term engagement it's kind of like um you can you, you could think of it similar to how businesses operate as well like do i want to just like push you know i could i could pump like so this much money into facebook ads and get this much clicks on my on my product or my advertisement um but does that really make you a good does that build like trust in your mm. in your customers? You know, does that does that make your your brand image better for your customers? And it's not necessarily true, right? Because people don't like to just mm -hmm. be forced full of ads all the time, right? They want to mm. instead like in, obviously like that's how you get customers initially, but after that you need to build sort of rapport with your with your audience and with your customers and 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 make them trust you as a company and or I guess you can think of myself as a company as a YouTuber. I want them to trust me as yeah. well, and so that's how I like to to think about it. Uh, yeah. more long-term. Yeah, really yeah taking the, the long-term view. I like it. I, more sustainable as well. <laughs> uh, sustainability comes back into the picture. I find it really interesting that you've already referred to yourself now as, you know, almost like a third ent entity, like as a company or to some extent also as a brand. Do you feel that that is to some extent inevitable once you go onto social media, that it's it's just you as a brand? And is that now what you're trying to sell? And how does the behavioral science of branding fit into all of this? <laughs> <laughs> so you to a certain extent uh you are a third entity like you're you're the, the myself that i put out on youtube is not who i am in real life not in, not in the sense that i'm being disingenuous or like or i'm like lying but in the sense <laughs> that obviously for my videos to be good i need to have a certain level of energy mm -hmm. a certain um I need to be in a certain mood. I need to be like really enthusiastic. And obviously it's, it's highly edited as well. And if you, if you watch my videos and pay really close attention to the cuts, you'll notice that there's like, I'll just be saying something really simple, but there'll be like 10 cuts because I would have fluffed <laughs> it up like so many times in the, in the takes. Um, and, and it's hilarious. Like I get some, I get some comments on my videos like, Oh, you're so articulate and you're so um, well-spoken in your videos. And I'm like, that is not how I am when I'm recording at all. Like I have, I have like so much, I, I mean, Marilyn and I, we talked about this the other day as well, but like for a 10 minute video, I'll have maybe like an hour and a half of, of footage sometimes. Mm. And like, and an hour and 20 minutes of that will just be me doing outtakes. Cause I, <laughs> I'm like, it's so used. To, it's so awkward to talk to a camera. Um, I thought you were quite articulate. I mean, so, uh, I mean, heads up, because this video is, is out and by the time that this gets published, but this video will have been old, uh, especially in, in YouTube terms, because time moves fast and social media moves even faster. But yeah, we did a video together. I thought you were really articulate. I actually really enjoyed recording uh, together. I didn't think it was, didn't, I didn't think much editing was required. But then again, I'm also not the one in this podcast who does the editing. So what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, you don't want to hear the unedited version of this podcast. You really don't. It's not entertaining at all. I think. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so so being a third party, like you do, you do view yourself as that, and also, um, branding. Yeah. So your your persona is your brand, and as a YouTuber, it's it's kind of interesting because you have to be charismatic and engaging, but at the same time, you have to have a certain level of vulnerability and honesty as well otherwise you just come across as fake a robot, a robot. Yeah. yeah like oh i'm just i'm just a yeah you know so um no i don't i'm not i'm not going to like deliberately tell people like my worst like fears like on my youtube <laughs> channel or anything um I didn't realize we were playing truth or dare peter <laughs> but I, I think i think the key to it is just to be uh to just kind of own the fact that you're not perfect and don't pretend to be, 
right? And just be like, well, yeah, like I'm going to, I fluff stuff up. I'm awkward. I, I hate watching back my own interviews with, um, with with Rory or, or with anyone else because I'm like, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm, I'm just so awkward and they're, they're talking to me and, and, and asking me questions and I'm just like, I look so dead-eyed and like glazed <laughs> over. And I'm like, why, why am I so awkward? And That's um, everyone's listening face though. Also a reason why this podcast does not have video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the video definitely doesn't add a lot to this podcast. Oh, like in the state we're in right now, this is pretty much 100%. So yeah. well done for doing the visual medium. That's a whole nother... Califish. Yeah, to actually help our audience oh, out with Sarah's description, uh, two out of three people are wearing gym clothes, and the other one <laughs> looks like they need to wash their hair very badly. That's all <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's it's super, super interesting and super cool that you've taken this step to like build a, a YouTube channel. And I think it just shows that anyone can do it. It like, you just need that. No, that, that sounds so harsh. <laughs> Anyone can do no, it, even it, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The, the barriers to entry are quite high, I think, because I think it takes a lot of confidence or guts to put yourself out there on that stage, like especially being a young person when we're constantly talking about people who've been in the field for so many more years. Our entire I mean, age. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, you can be paralyzed from saying something wrong or being considered like too young or like too naive. So, I mean, did any did any of that cross your mind? I mean, it's definitely crossed my mind with this podcast. I mean, this was your idea. Any... yeah, but still, still, you get that voice in the back of your head. Has that been anything that you've had to think about or deal yeah, with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that I'm super young. And the more I, I it's kind of, it's kind of a Dunning-Kruger effect, right? Like the more I learn, mm -hmm. the more rubbish I know that I am. <laughs> the feel that's that I'm in. That's not what that is. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's completely how I feel about it too. I, I get that. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. actually doing, doing this master's over the last few months uh, has been a super humbling experience because I realized like, oh, wow, I really don't know as much oh, as I yeah. thought I did, you know. No, oh, this I, master's I, handed my ass to me as well. I was like, oh, I yeah. thought I was smart. And then I saw R and I just cried in the corner. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I do I do, I do, do get that. I, I, that's why I said at the start, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cocky 22-year-old with a YouTube channel because here I am making videos like, oh, you know, if you're, if you're designing your behavioral intervention using this bias or this heuristic, you should um, do it in this way or that way. And I'm like, I've barely done any interventions myself. <laughs> like... <laughs> You know, I've done like two or three maybe in my in my career, if you can call it that. And um, and, I, and here I am giving advice to people who are like experts. Um, but so I think I think getting people onto the channel is a good way of me combating that because I'm like, well, I'm I'm totally going to be honest and say, you know, so much more than me. You know um, how to do this way better than me. Let me just talk to you and pick your brains because you know it's better coming from your mouth than mine. Like maybe we agree, maybe we. Like norm normally what I say or think agrees with whatever they say and, and think, but, um, but it it's recognizing that fact that, yeah, I am super young and, uh, I shouldn't pretend to know everything. And people in the comments correct me as well. Occasionally, um, huh. they'll say in a hostile like, manner or is it all still quite friendly because social media can get vicious. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had a couple of haters, but it's in, on, on the, on the whole, it's been quite friendly, uh, or, uh, at least cordial and professional in the way that they reply to my videos they say oh actually you know i think maybe you missed this point or uh or i think maybe your explanation on this could have been you know is 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 not really holistic enough and you've got to consider this other factor and i'm like oh, okay so that's kind of the fun of it as well and thinking about my youtube channel as sort of um an opener to a debate uh, mm, it's, yeah. is, is, is a better way to think about it. So I say, well, here, here is my research. Here's what I found when I did my, because a lot of my videos are basically just video literature reviews of, of a certain topic. Which and, I thoroughly enjoy. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll say, well, here, here's, here's what I identified as the key studies. Here's what I, is my understanding of, of this topic. Mm. Um, and then I'll often ask, uh, please go to the comments and tell me what you think and unfortunately people don't always do that but when they do mm -hmm. um it's really fun because they'll say oh well, actually i think of it this way i think about it that way uh, and, and then we can have that debate and uh mm -hmm. or, or, or just conversation um about the topic and, and that helps me learn and helps them learn and i think that's probably the the best way for me to think about it because i know i'm not i'm not yeah. that good right I'm, i am still young i am still learning and i haven't done that much in the field as well um so getting other people to come in and talk about it with me that's that's the best part of it
Yeah. And in a way, I think you're doing what we're doing, but way better because a (laughs) podcast is very much just a couple of people having a conversation in a closed room. And I don't know, people have their cups up against the wall, like listening in, but you're actually offering a platform to start a conversation and bring people and points of view into the debate. So yeah. And and I I would also say in some ways your age is... I think it's young, yeah, because your experience with this type of technology and your knowledge of social media and your ability to be genuine on the channel of just saying, "Hey, I have a camera, I've got a platform, I have an opinion, I've done, you know, this is just what I what I think." So, yeah, I know the imposter syndrome is real, and (laughs) yeah, I get it completely. But you're doing a great job. Thank you. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. (laughs) I'm actually really happy that it was so, I mean, I, I saw this, this gap in the market, if you will, of having a YouTube channel. Um, I've, I've seen it for a while. I'm, I'm glad it was you, uh, or at least someone like you, if you will, who filled it up because to be quite, no, but I, I'll be quite frank about why I think this, because there, there's a couple of, obviously in the podcast scene as well, there's a couple of really like highly produced, uh, podcasts, like for example, Choiceology, great fucking podcast, but you can tell it's producing its money backed. Um, and I think, if if anyone were to do uh, a YouTube channel and reap any of the the benefits of it, or actually you know um, to the extent you know get famous off it, whatever you want to call it, um, then I'm, I'm glad it's someone like you, someone who is young and invested in the science, and maybe to some extent doesn't have the experience yet, but also isn't rooted in what behavioral science used to be 20 years ago. Because I'm starting to get a bit worried that the the generations above us are 20 year on up so like they're now halfway through 40 whatever no but this they have they have a perception of behavioral science and what it was and what it is and what it should be and i'm currently and i mean i'm known for running an interview series with like famous behavioral scientists they're a bit older as well but next that i ran a next gen series so with younger people which included you two so you can't hate on the series <laughs> yeah we can't say anything i thought it was i thought it was more interesting like i'm not not to discredit any of the experts in the field but to me obviously we're gonna start this field eventually like we're gonna join and then properly contribute once we're older um <laughs> however long that may take but i mean at the end of the day we're gonna end up shaping this field as well right so for me it's much more to some extent more interesting and maybe to some extent also more controversial to see what's going on there so i'm happy it's someone like you someone young who's still really really open-minded uh, and passionate I'm I'm glad it's someone like you. Thank you. Yeah, I I think I think that's a benefit to it as well. I don't have any like super concrete ideas about what behavioral science is, um, and in fact, doing the channel has shifted my perception of of our field massively. Oh, yeah. Talking to Ghana was um, one of the best uh, things that I've I've done for for myself as as learning in this field because um, because she said you know we're, we've become so obsessed in behavioral science about talking about. Um, this obsession of uh, this is what economics said and this is what behavioral science says and this is why economics is wrong and blah, 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 blah. And, and she said, you know, that's, that's not really what economics looks like anymore. You know, a lot of economists are incorporating ideas like prospect theory into them, new models. And, and modern economics is behavioral economics. There isn't really that much of a distinction and a dichotomy. And instead, behavioral economics is a collaborative field. And so we shouldn't be trying to make enemies and, and say like, oh, you know, you're wrong, I'm right, and that kind of thing. It's it's more like, hey, let's come together, let's let's share our knowledge, pool our knowledge together about how humans really behave, uh, and then you know make that into our current field. Um, so so that's that's just an example of how my perception of of uh, behavioral economics has has changed um, since doing the YouTube channel, and and on that point of, of the generation gap, I I think that you're right that a lot of older older people in the field perhaps um, mm. do have these kind of uh, rigid ideas, maybe it's research that they did themselves and they go, you know, it's, it's hard for them. It's hard to say that you're wrong, right? Mm. Uh, after a while. Um, but on that point, I, I recently attended a talk uh, from Kauri with our friend Azim, who used to be at work, uh, and, and uh, somebody else at Kauri as well. And they said that um, one of the things that they do is is they mm. get young people to join their, their company, right? And, and that is how they themselves update their knowledge of the field because they recognize that young people do come at it with a different perspective and they do come at it uh, depending on their background with a different point of view and that actually helps them to develop and understand the, the most you know recent findings because i guess if you're day in day out you know just 
talking to clients, putting out interventions mm-hmm. to the real world, you don't really have time to go look at, you know, what's the latest literature and all of that stuff, right? So I I think there is a there is a, a problem with um mm-hmm. a lack of flexibility in the older generations, but they also I think they're not um ignorant to it. Like they recognize that perhaps uh, younger people have something to add uh, to add value to them and no i i think it's i think it's a good con- i think it's a good conclusion in itself just being like you know that there is i mean f- for all your 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 lack of years and to some extent your lack of experience if you will yeah, there there is value to add here and it's just purely perspective well yeah, i think i think there's like a, a wider point mm-hmm. about you know diversity and bringing in different perspectives in in general whether that's more young voices or people with different backgrounds and training or you know people who have just different things to say looking at the same picture I mean, it's definitely valuable while well, reading your next gen series Merlo um, one of the things that was consistent among a lot of people who you interviewed was that yeah. um, there's a general sentiment that our field is too weird right that we're too um, white yep. educated industrialized rich Democratic. What, so white that, and Western um, is, is well, Western, but also, I guess, white oh, is yeah, a sorry. <laughs> White and Western. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Both apply. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, def- that's definitely a point of view. Like, we need to, we need to diversify more. Being, being on the master's course right now, it's super interesting because we have people from all over the world um, in our discussion groups. So, we have uh, some nice. people from China. Um, we got uh, somebody from Argentina, someone from Brazil, and um, the, the question that keeps coming up again and again in our discussions is, you know, how does this apply cross culturally? And um, the response from from our lecturers is often like, I don't know because there's no literature on it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Like, I, I, maybe it's the same, maybe it's not, uh, but we don't really know. And mm-hmm. kind of the, the the best we have at the moment is just yeah. sort of looking at um, Eastern versus Western, collectivist versus individualist cultures and i and yeah that's okay i mean all right so that's a start but it's it's like you got to broad you got to broadly associate all of like east like all of the eastern nations together as like one thing no, and all of the western really. nations together as one thing like it's not that's not really very cross cultural you know yeah so i think i think that's definitely a direction that our field is going to develop in the future for sure yeah that's what i was just going to say as well like talking about the future like what are you most excited I don't know, to learn next or to sort of hear about the sort of developments or what would you like to work on? Well, like, like I said earlier, my, 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 my hand is in so many different pots. It's, it's hard to, to pick one thing. Um, mm-hmm. I think what Susan yeah. Mitchie's doing is really good at mm-hmm. the uh, behavior change project, right? I think that's super important and I can't wait to see the, the final result of that when that eventually does come out. Um, but I think like having this sort of more robust, mm-hmm codification of our field is going to be really really valuable um and i hope i hope that just more sort of breakdown in our obsession with gdp and and using that as our main metric for how our economies and our policy making functions is is going to be the most impactful thing for our field right because yeah. i think i uh, i talked to samuel Salzer about this in, in my interview with him um we didn't make it into the final video, unfortunately. But basically, what we agreed on was that our field is kind of too cute at the moment. It's too, like, it, yeah, in the sense that, like, oh, let's let's um, get people to, you know, use reusable straws or something. You know, it's like it's like little. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah or, or, or not eat marshmallows. Or not eat marshmallows. Yeah, exactly. It's all. Or it's eat all... the marshmallows. <laughs> what you like? <laughs> like that's a very, that's a very practical way to apply uh, our knowledge of human behavior but it is small scale right like we're not going to um completely revolutionize the world by getting people to like use a metal straw you know so we need to think bigger and get behavioral science into being the core of policy making and in the core of, of of business and industry as well um if you there's a really great interview on rory's podcast with um uh the I can't remember his official title now, but it's like the brand manager of of Oatly, you know, the the oat milk company, right? Oh. Now, oh yes, Oatly is a fascinating company because they don't do any advertising, they don't do any magazine ads, TV well, doesn't, ads. Doesn't matter. I still buy their shit. <laughs> exactly, but yet they're so popular, right? Yeah, and so, so popular. 
And it's interesting with their company operates because they basically have a behavioral science person at the core of their company. So this nice. guy that Rory was interviewing says, yeah, I'm in every single meeting, whether it's a finance meeting, a marketing meeting, a, a product meeting, I'm in there at the start and, and everything is shaped around how does this affect people's perception of the brand and people's behavior. Um, nice. And so I think that's where behavioral science needs to be headed next. Like we need, we in every single <laughs> and maybe maybe this is me being too zealous here, but in every single important meeting, you need to have behavioral science at the core of it because ultimately um, the ultimate goal is to change people's behavior. And so why would we not have a behavioral expert in that conversation um, all the time? And I think that's where the field is going to develop is, is going to be, let's have more broad impact at, at a fundamental level and not just do all these cute little um, projects on the side, right? All right. Yeah, yeah. With- with great power comes great responsibility. So, yeah, we just got to make sure that we're all ethical and responsible. But yeah. Oh, yes. yeah, what it is time future. for mass manipulation. I'm not ready. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> that's terrifying in its way. Yeah, no, but I, I think that's. Uh, I like that. That's a very good answer for that question. I have to say, Pete. Oh, thank you. You did well. Just telling that. So let's yeah. end on a high note. Then last question to always ask. You now have the air, or you, we are on air. I don't even know how this fucking works with a podcast. You have the air. I don't know. <laughs> you have the time, the space. Just edit this out. Pete, is there anything Never. that you would like to plug? If people want to know more about you, find out more about you, where can they find you? And this a, is going to be a long list. <laughs> I'm a YouTuber. Of course I have things to plug. Okay. Um, <laughs> please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's called Pete's Bits on YouTube. Um the bits stands for behavioral insights and theories. Um, so just Pete's bits. To are, clarify that. Just to clarify, yeah. So uh, Pete's bits on YouTube. Uh, I just reached seven hundred subscribers today, so it'd be great. Ooh. Thank you. So Actually, be- well, when this video or from this video, Jesus Christ, when this podcast finally goes up, you'll probably already have a thousand. Oh, that would be. <laughs> We're recording this before Christmas, is very likely. <laughs> Don't give it away, Mella. Uh, this is all live. It's all an illusion. Fourth wall. <laughs> fourth wall. What do you mean this is all live? This stuff gets edited to filth. <laughs> no, no, that's just how we sound in real life. <laughs> it's <not>. true. <laughs> okay, so yeah, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Pete Spitz. You can follow me on Twitter at Pete Judo. You can follow my Instagram at Pete Spitz Official. Uh, and if you want, you can add me on LinkedIn at Peter Judo De Hacho. Don't worry, we'll spell his last name down below. You'll be Thank fine. You. All the yeah. links are down below as well, as always. But if you want to do one of those things, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Pete. I think you are the first uh, Welsh Welshman we've had on the podcast. No. So it's no, that's incorrect. Rory is, Rory is no? Welsh. Yeah. Okay. I'm editing that out. You are the second. <laughs> Welshman. No, just say we the first YouTuber. Oh, and that's also not true because we've had Ghana. And she's a YouTuber as well. She's yeah, also okay. A the first Welsh YouTuber we've had on the podcast. Wow. So what an honor. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, this is my <laughs> this is my first time being interviewed ever. So yeah, um, that's an honor for me as well. And thank you so much uh, for having me. Oh, on you're the, very the welcome. Podcast. I have a feeling there's many more to come. I feel like once we've done an interview, like who else has podcasts? Uh, Christian, Behavioral Grooves. I mean, they're, they're, they'll be with you in no time. Oh, no, no. This is it. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. This is it. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Pete. So that was us talking to Peter or Pete Spitz on YouTube, which is still a very interesting name, a bit, a bit <laughs> saucy even. Uh, so Sarah, what did you think? I I love meeting and speaking with Pete. I think he's a an absolutely great guy, and I'm just excited to see what he produces next, like with his content. I mean, I I love YouTube. I watch YouTube a lot. I love the sort of the video essay format, and I just think what pete's doing is is a great service to the behavioral science community like the the content is so it's it's such a natural fit for this sort of uh, mode of communication and presentation so yeah i just i can't wait to see what he comes out with next i think he's uh i think he's a, a rising star of the profession in in my humble opinion <laughs> Fair play to you. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I'm excited about what he's done so far. I'm excited about what's coming next. 
And in general, I'm excited about the fact that it seems to be that, like, you know, younger people, I mean, not, not trying to pat ourselves on the back here, but I'm talking like even younger people are just, you know, grabbing these opportunities with their, like, with the advantage of knowing tech and social media probably a lot better than, you know, anyone of any other generation does. And just propelling themselves forward that way, I think it's I think it's to be recommended. I think it's great, and I one hundred percent support it. Yeah, I think what what it comes down to, which is what I think is really important, is that you know getting behavioral science, the type of the actual science, the insights, the process of sharing knowledge outside of that academic bubble or those sort of tightly curated communities is only going to do us the absolute world of good about allowing people to engage with the content with no prerequisite essentially yeah absolutely, absolutely. i think yeah i think it's, it's part of how we broaden the voices contributing to the community of behavioral science it's part of how we reach out and uh engage with people and communicate and i'm I'm, I'm become challenged as well you know sometimes i think when when you're inside all of this you can't see the wood from the trees a little bit and uh yeah i think it's it's nice to engage in that Uh, not not just nice i think it's important and necessary that we engage in these conversations especially when we're talking about behavioral science becoming this major uh sort of linchpin within uh global organizations or institutions or you know having a behavioral scientist in every room i think it's important that you know it's it's not so highly uh curated as a as a community of like you know the the barriers of of entry needn't be so high i think yeah absolutely right so what do you think is next behavioral science tiktok (laughs) i think i think there is i i saw um some doctors over the pandemic engaging with tiktok uh, and doing these sort of short 60 seconds or less videos about educating people about you know what's in the vaccine or uh what sort of behaviors are really going to help reduce the spread of you know covid19 in the pandemic and i thought that's a, a, f- a fantastic way to really engage with people and so why not why not behavioral science tiktok we just got to find someone who um knows tiktok and I, that's not me um, no, it's not me it. either yeah. i'm not this is like i think when tiktok came out that that was the one time when like i was like now i'm old like new social media is coming out i'm like i'm not interested i'm not bothered i do not wish to partake and to be quite frank and this is what i know makes me old i don't get it <laughs> really interesting um, I mean, I know how it works. Like, I get it to that extent, but I'm just really not fast. Like, I don't get the hype. I I think it's it's so weirdly addictive. There's so much good content on there. I have to admit, I've I've been in one TikTok. The last Ooh. lockdown, yeah. If we did one of those like dance videos, oh um, no, no, which, it no. was just hilarious. It's just so much fun, and and okay. I yeah. I'm going to end the episode on that note before you reveal any more embarrassing things about yourselves. It's too late. Guys, <laughs> it is. It really is. Guys, as always, we hope you enjoyed the episode. We hope you thought it was thought-provoking, educational, or at least entertaining. Thanks again for Pete making the time to come on here. Make sure you follow at least his YouTube channel because he really produces some good shit. Honestly, it's definitely worth checking out. And otherwise, it's 10 minutes of your day. You just spend an hour on this podcast. I think you can manage. Guys, as always, thanks for listening and have a good week. Thanks. Bye. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the one to love. You're the one I want to give to. 